Hey, good evening, and welcome to the pandemic version of Montpelier Civic Forum. Pandemic being, of course, we have a town meeting on Tuesday, March 2nd, of which most of you will vote by absentee mail, and we hope that you will vote. But at the same time, we hope that you'll watch these shows because they're good shows and they present to you the things you need to vote intelligently. We've got a number of really good candidates, school board and city council. We've got one person running for the Parks Commission for a five-year term. And we have Ann Watson presenting the view of Montpelier from the mayor's seat, the projects that are ongoing, the projects that are going to be kind of slowed down, the projects that probably won't happen for a long time. And we have Jim Murphy, the school board president tonight, who is going to present the school board budget. Jim, thank you for coming. Well, thank you for having me, Richard. This is not our first time, yes? No, it is not our first time. It's always good to be here. School budget. You've held all kinds of hearings yes. on it. You've got budget documents that you would not believe sitting on your website. Uh, it's kind of like the, the film Rashomon. People are looking at the same event and seeing it differently. Notice that illusion for those of you who've seen that film. Yeah. The district's budget. How is it evolving still? I think the budget itself is has been, I think, pretty stable since you know, we started formulating it. It's, it's, a, it's a responsible hold-the-line budget. It, it meets the needs of our students. It doesn't have any major initiatives in it. This is not the year for it. I think we're, what's evolving is everything around it, obviously. Doesn't, is the state, is their figure, their contribution solid yet? Uh, right now, the, you know, my understanding is the, the information we've gotten, the latest information we've gotten out of, out of the House is that the, the, the state contribution, the state yield, is going to be significantly higher than we originally anticipated, which is good news for Montpelier taxpayers. It means that um, the, the anticipated tax impact of what's a, a very sober budget uh, is going to be much less than we originally um, thought. Yeah, you know, we really came in to this year knowing the overall financial situation with COVID, with the fact that uh, the state numbers were going to be uncertain at best. Um, uh, you know, fortunately, we had a, I, I think we had, we have a fantastic business manager who's, you know, been planning for tough times and for a, a district that could weather tough times. Uh, so we came in with kind of that mentality that we wanted to hold the line. We wanted to make sure that, that we didn't have to have cuts that would, uh, you know, impair our ability to, to give an excellent education to the kids and that we'd, you know, kind of survive until we, we pulled out of the other side of this pandemic. So that was the tone we started in September and it, it carried through. Now to contrast that with the city budget, Bill was making cuts in that city budget during the last year. Yeah. He was downward adjusting as the year went on. Did the schools have to do that? Uh, we really didn't. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a, the budget is overall a 2.8% a uh, increase in spending, which actually you know, kind of tracks inflation um, and is smaller than the budgets of the last few years. And the actual education spending is about 2.1 percent, which is which is the money that comes from the city and the state. Some of that spending comes from federal grants. Um, so overall, it was not cuts, but but um, increases that were just basically in line with with what we had to do to keep up. Now, regardless of whether there were students, let's go back in the spring when we had to close yeah. the schools down. The schools still had to be heated. Yep. The staff stayed on, if I'm correct. Yes. So the costs were fixed costs, regardless of whether the students were in the schools or not in the schools. Yes. So there was no money saved because students were at home uh, doing home instruction. No, there's, <coughs> there, there were no money saved. Um, in fact, one of the things that uh, the board, uh, with leadership from Libby, set early on was- Libby we, being? Libby, the superintendent, Libby Bonesteel. Um, being that we, we wanted to, especially with the district employees, uh, make sure that, that they stayed whole through this process. Um, you know, a lot of the district employees, such as teachers, uh, still had jobs to do. Um, 
Some did not, though. Some of the staff, uh, without the buildings being open, did, did not have uh, jobs to do, but we wanted to make sure that they were not, not left out. So we, you know, we, we maintained um, you know, those salaries through the closure. Now, the board is a supervisory board over your superintendent and her staff. Over, over the superintendent directly. We only directly supervise the right, superintendent. Right. We, don't, we don't directly supervise staff below that. So you set the goals and objectives and st yes. metric standards that the district will be adjudged by. Libby Bone still and her staff and her, um, her staff in the schools as well administer to the goals that you guys have set hoping to meet the metrics that you guys have established. Is yeah. that a good overview of how it works? Yeah, I mean, we kind of broadly set policies based on uh, you know, educational goals and, and community values. And, uh, you know, and, and those, those policy and goals are uh, kind of directional and aspirational. And then Libby deals with the day-to-day the -day operation of the school and the you know, the managerial decisions within those, those policy parameters. Were you able as a board to adjudge the um, success, you know, as you define it, of spring, of what, was, what it was like when we first went virtual? Have, have you been able to tell whether that was what you would consider to be successful? It was an experiment on yeah. the fly, but... Um, I think, you know, it's... it's it's a hard thing to judge, and like quite honestly, the I think the mentality in just in spring was to get through it as as best as possible. I mean, there was there were so many so many both adjustments that needed to be made, um, and you know, like families were were dealing with uh, you know having to you know supervise their kids online. You know, the, the teachers had a huge adjustment. I think we did. And parents about, were online for their work. And parents were online for their work. I mean, it was just huge adjustments across the board. I think we did about as well as we could have. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that, uh, in fact, I, I'm quite sure that kids did not get the same educational experience that they would have gotten if we didn't have to do that. Uh, but I think we got through it. I think we got through it in a way that um, kept most kids up to pace. And then... Uh, you know, what the focus on was from, you know, the end of last school year to the beginning of this school year, uh, and the, the administrators of the school, led by Libby Bonesteel, but also all the principals, the, you know, the curriculum director, um, you know, the, the special ed director, et cetera, um, worked tirelessly over the summer. I mean, they were working, you know, six, seven days a week, you know, 12 plus hours a day for a good portion of the summer to put in place a system that allowed for a return, a largely in-person return this year. And I think this year has been uh, uh, quite a success. Now, other districts approached it differently. Yes. Can you take us inside the board's thinking? Because this budget presupposes everybody's gonna be back in school. Yes. So take us inside the board's thinking on the school districts that chose a couple of days a week you'll be in school, a couple of days a week you'll be at home, and then the thinking about if you're going to be at home and you don't like it, you can't go into school. You can't easily yeah. go back into school lane, or vice versa for that matter. What was the thinking that went into that, and when was that, decision, when was that discussion happening? I mean, those discussions happened all through summer. I mean, Libby did a great job of showing us the uh, showing us the, the the data and the information she was working with in terms of you know what our spacing looked like, uh, what the directions were from the governor, and for a while there there like you know I, I think the governor has done a very good job of putting Vermont in a position where we have a lot more in-person schooling than uh, a lot of other states, but. Uh, for a while, there was not clear direction and oftentimes changing direction during the summer. So, uh, you know, so the administration was constantly, constantly dealing with that. Um, I think our attitude towards the administration, it was, we're going to support you. We, uh, we value in-person learning. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big goal. We think it's best for our kids, best for our families. Obviously, it, it needs to be safe. 
Um, we need to protect both our employees and our students and our students' families um, from the, the spread of COVID. Uh, but you know, that's a goal. And you know, finding out how to do that was uh, something that the administration largely did and we were updated on. And, and you know, the updates we got through the summer, um, you know, plans changed and there was a lot of problem solving. Uh, but what came into place was, uh, I think, one of the best plans in the state. Boy, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot right now. Just give yep. me ballpark. How many parents opted, or how many families or students, whichever way you want to look at it, opted to stay at home and, and not do in-person learning? Uh, it was around 20%. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was important and, and I know there was some inflexibility there. And I really, like, honestly, when that option came out, I didn't know how that was going to turn out. I, I kind of felt, um, I felt there was a possibility that, that it could be one of those things where once a few families did it and, you know, it might create concern and it could be a snowball. Um, I think 20% turned out to be a, a pretty good number um, in terms of, of getting most of our, our students back in school and then also giving an option for families that didn't feel safe doing that. The, the reason that it had to be rigid was because there were some major personnel and spacing plans that depended on knowing how many people were going to be in school because, you know, we're doing the pods. Those pods are really... What are pods? So pods are basically, you know, the way that we've been able to return in school is uh, keeping tight groups together that, that have very little interaction between them. So, uh, so that way, if there is any sort of outbreak, it's easily contained. Um, and it also means having two adults to each pod. So, each, so the pods are basically, um, and this is kind of the, the, the model at the elementary school and the middle school, uh, it's, it's a class with two adults in it with, with a, a, a teacher and someone to help the teacher, and also someone who can be... But there's a subclass within that class that are together? A pod is, uh, if it's a 25-person class. Oh, no, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a classroom. So each, each fifth grade, you know, there's, what, uh, four or five fifth, fifth grade classes. Mm -hmm. Each one is a pod. Oh, so a pod is a euphemism for a class. It's basically a euphemism for a class, but they stay together all the time. They eat lunch together. So, so the, the things that happen in normal school, you know, maybe like, you know, they go to band together. Like, you know, band mixes fifth graders, sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders. Uh, you know, they go eat lunch together in a common cafeteria. All of that activity has basically gone away. Or maybe they, you know, so, so that classroom, a pod is basically a classroom. That classroom stays together. And another difference is it has two adults as opposed to, to, to one adult. Um, and, and the two adult model is if, if you know, one, one goes of the, out. If, yeah, if one goes out, you don't have to bring in a, a sub who's not from that pod. So it's, it's basically. If I could walk you back to one incident and how pods affected it, the hockey outbreak. Yes. At, at, could you explain that, uh, what that is or was, I suppose, and, and how pods Effect we're affecting that. Or, or well, that occurred outside of the district. Um, you know, that was. It was our, someone who brought it back from New Hampshire. Who's yeah, and and it was it, it was a club event um, <coughs> where where I think that uh, yeah where the efficacy of that was shown with our school was there was um, someone carried that into a classroom, um, and there were a couple people who were infected in that classroom. Uh, we were able to, you know, shut that pod down and then we took a precautionary measure and, and closed that school for uh, a week. Um, and that contained the outbreak. That was, was the end of the outbreak. And I think we had uh, another case in, in another pod where we were just able to have that pod go remotely um, and, and not close the school. I, I could be wrong on that, but that's how I remember it. Um, and again, that was contained. So by having those pod structures, you, you're able to contract trace, you're able to know uh, with a fair degree of certainty who an infected person may have come in contact with, and you're able to kind of contain that and not have it spread throughout the school. Did we learn anything from this experience 
that you think will be carried into the fall? Will we have the pod concept even without COVID or two teachers? Or is there anything that's coming out of this? Uh, the specials over the computer? Uh... Um, I think there's going to be lessons learned. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear from the educators about things that have worked and things that, that have, have not worked. Um, I mean, I think some of the lessons learned have been, you know, technology is a, is a, can be a huge piece of education, but uh, I think the value of in-person learning is, has, has been emphasized. I, I think that, um, and I think we're seeing this right now in, in some districts and states that haven't really gone back to in-person learning. Um, kids want to be together in a classroom, and I think that's where they do best. Um, you know, can we find some ways to integrate technology um, or integrate, you know, different teaching styles? And have we learned those lessons? I think there probably will be some lessons learned, but I'm going to let the educators kind of ruminate on that. Did we learn anything about our physical facilities and their inadequacies? I, I think actually our physical facilities have, have been able to house this pretty well. Uh, we have... Uh, you know, two schools that are in person five days a week. Uh, that's not true in all districts, and some of that's Which two based. schools are those? Uh, actually, we have four, three schools, uh, Roxbury, Union, and, and Main Street Middle School. Um, and the Montpelier High School is um, in person four days a week. Um, and, and uh, you know, Rene DeVore, the principal there, came up with, I think, a pr pretty brilliant strategy to to allow that to happen. How did what did she do? So she went to um, <laughs> because the the pod structure is hard at a high school because yeah you know, because unlike fifth grade it's you, you're not in a fifth grade and you don't you know sit in fifth grade all all day uh, you know students take various courses and uh, you know those classes naturally mix so you know in in normal high school you've got you know a, the student has you know four or five classes throughout <laughs> the day. All those classes look different in terms of the composition. They've got you know five different teachers and five classes with five different compositions in it. Um, so so how to minimize the mixing is she kind of went to a model of I think Middlebury and some other colleges use this where you do intensive quarter courses. So each student is taking two two classes per quarter intensively. So uh, instead of, you know, eight classes over the course of the year all mixed together, they're doing two, 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 and two each quarter intensively. So that way uh, they're only in two groups um, for a three-month period and then they move to. So know, it's another. like the college model of changing from quarters to semesters. Yeah, exactly. So let's just look at the district itself. You've got Montpelier High School now has 382 students, ironically the same as Main Street Middle School. Yes. They caught up. Uh, 399 in Union. Yep. And 32 in the Roxbury Village School. Now taking the Roxbury Village School and putting it aside, uh, what's the peak capacity? Have, have any of those schools reached what you would consider the new peak capacity? Obviously, 399 students, for those of you who went to uh, Montpelier to Union Elementary School. For those of you who went to Union Elementary School, there were far more than 399 students, but the school was configured differently yeah. then. Where are we in terms of reaching our maximum at um, Main Street Middle and Union? Because obviously the high school has a greater maximum than 380 some odd students. Uh you know, my understanding is, you know, we're not at capacity yet. Main Street's pretty crowded. Um, it's, yeah, we're at the point where it's, it's, it's going to be, if a lot more people went to Main Street, it would be difficult to find, find space for them. Um, you know, and I think, I think Union has space, but is, it's, it's not too roomy there either. I'm going to hit this out of order, but it just yeah. came to mind. Do we anticipate losing any of that 20% to homeschooling? Uh, Is that written into the assumptions of the district's model? Uh, no, I, I don't think we've written any assumptions about losing 
students to homeschooling. It's, it's a possibility. Um, I've, and, and it may happen. I'm not sure it's going to happen in, in substantial numbers. Uh, we have 147 teachers, of which 143 are full-time equivalency. And I'm not even going to get into the difference. It, it's yeah. half-time, part-time. It's what makes the glue work in this high school. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> how does that compare with the past? I think it's similar to the past. I'd, I'd have to look at the numbers, but um, I think it's relatively on par to historic. We numbers. have an experienced teaching crew in this district. Do we yes. anticipate getting a number of retirements soon? Yeah, we get retirements. Yeah, you know, I've been on the board for a while now. Um, you know, we've gotten some very fine teachers who, who have retired. Uh, I think the good news is we've attracted, we have a lot of young talent too. Uh, or newer talent, and um, I think as I think, you know, we've got a strong district with strong leadership uh, and a supportive community, uh, and you know, we're able to attract good talent to teaching positions. Um, you know, as as teachers retire, our administrative levels are those holding constant? Are we picking up, dropping off in terms of percent that's administrative um, staff? I know there's a state guideline that for that, and we fall well within it. Yeah, no, our administrative staff has pre stayed pretty constant. Um, the only expansion we had was a few years ago. We added a a vice principal at Union, which was needed given the size of that school. Um, I don't anticipate any increases or decreases at the administrative level, and, and we've got uh, we've got a, a very solid administrative team. I'm going to warn the viewer, now is the time we're going into weeds. Yes. So this, this is going to get technical here. Health rates are increasing by 9.8%. Yes. They're not increasing that to that level in the, in the city. What is causing that level, and is that normal for you guys? Is that a high year? Or um, can you control it in any way? I have, you know, I have never fully understood how health numbers work. Um, they, it always seems to accelerate it at paces well beyond the, the increase in other expenses. 9.8% um, is a concerning number. It's a big number. It, it's not out of line with other numbers we've contended with, unfortunately. It, health costs are expensive, and they increase at um, large and chunky rates. Okay, now we're going further into the weeds, talking about the merger incentive. Yes. It went down from four cents to two cents. Yep. Which starts with a definition of what is the merger incentive, what did it start at to get down to four cents? So it started at, at eight cents. Um, and What is the merger incentive? So under Act 46, was, which was the act under which Montpelier and Roxbury <coughs> emerged, um, Maybe what, three years ago now. Uh, the state gave districts that merged uh, an incentive, which is basically a, a tax reduction uh, that would phase out over time. Uh, and, and I think the idea was that, one, it would entice districts to merge, and then also I think there was an the idea that, that costs of merger would be um, somewhat absorbed by, by that, that tax incentive. Um, uh, our merger had an eight cents tax incentive. I don't remember if that was particular to our district or just what all districts got. Uh, it's dropped two cents each year over time. So uh, the, the, the de facto result of that is it's been a two cent increase each year. Um, we, we got a, a nice dip and now it's stepping up by two cents each year and next year it'll be gone. Um, what does that mean in practical terms? Uh, it, it means that two cents on every hundred dollars, you get a discount, and that discount so that's coming back goes away uh, each year. So each year we have to pay two cents more than we otherwise would have. Um, and you know, Grant has done a good job of who is Grant? Grant Ga Geiser is the business manager. Has you know this this was an anticipated. You know, we knew this was coming. So, um, the the budget planning since the merger has 
has planned for ways to ensure that this does not um, fall we don't feel this. Yeah. Now we're going to go even deeper yes. when we have to discuss why there's a 3.1% increase in Montpelier and Roxbury is seeing an 8.5% decrease. Uh, there's a, a few reasons. One was the way the merger was, was structured. Um, Roxbury had a very expensive, uh, a very expensive structure before the merger occurred. Structure in what in sense? In terms of, uh, their their all their students were tuitioned, so um, their their savings from the merger was enormous, and that savings continues to be realized over time. So, so that's one thing. Whereas with Montpelier, the effect was was pretty negligible. Um, we had a little bit of a savings, um, but our our trajectory is is relatively what it would have been without the merger. A little a little bit of a savings, but but not a ton. Now that tuitioning meant that kids who were getting out of the village school were able to go to other school districts, and that would be paid for out of this. Now that that practice ended, didn't it? That with practice the ended, yeah. But but the Roxbury, you know, when when Roxbury merged, they were in an unsustainable financial situation with how much the tuition system was costing them. Um, so again, their savings was is has been, you know, quite substantial because they were in a upward spiraling situation. But that should be as that ended, the Roxbury savings should be going down, down, down. The Roxbury savings is going down. Eventually, it will level out, but it has not ours? leveled out yet. Yes. The other piece, so that's that's a merger piece. The other piece that plays into is is what's called the common level of appraisal, which is the statewide tax equalized tax rate yes. for education. <laughs> exactly. Now, what so, is that? I know what it is, but possibly they don't. So it's it's basically an equity measure that um, disincentivizes wealthier communities that have higher property values from undervaluing their property. Because, uh, you know, you're obviously you're, you're taxed on the value of your property. Uh, right now, Montpelier's assessed property value is substantially less than houses are selling for. So the common level of appraisal is a mechanism in our educational tax system that accounts for that depressed assessment. And so, so communities like Montpelier that right now have assessment rates well below what the actual market value is effectively get penalized. Whereas communities like Roxbury that are actually seeing houses sell at or at sometimes below their assessed rate don't get penalized. Um, so that the, the, the idea behind the penalty is that it makes up for that depressed assessment. Um, so that way, you know, towns like Stowe and Montpelier can't undervalue their, their property and pay less while other communities pay more. Um, an aside on that, uh, and the budget showed with Bill and Ann, yes. Bill spends a lot of time speaking of the coming appraisal that will be in our community in about two years. Yes. Half of its cost is budgeted in the city budget this year, and then half of it will be in the following year. But there yeah. will be a reappraisal that will be coming that will take us to the 100% level Yep. And I believe that Bill said it was nine years ago that we did our appraisal in town. Yeah. Uh, but if you want more information, that, that's a real good source. And that's Bill and Ann's budget, city budget program that, that's yeah. broadcasting right now on Orca's uh, YouTube channel as well as on the cable. Yeah, and, and the, effect, the effect on tax rates will, um, the practical effect will be zero. The... Uh, but you'll pay for but it. But nobody way. lives in the practical world. Well, Some of us will see it go down, relatively speaking. Some of us will see it yeah. go up. Well, what's, what's going to happen is instead of, of having 
this tax increase occur each year as a result of the common level of appraisal, you're going to have a one-time bump in the value of your house and the assessment value, and then your property tax is going to go up to meet that new value. But the pool doesn't grow. All no, the, the, it's the same pool. It's the same pool, so that relatively speaking, if Jim's house goes up a certain yeah. level, mine might remain constant. Yes. Uh, so that it doesn't hit everyone equally. You can't yeah. look at this and go, oh my God, the world's falling apart in two years. Yeah. Although the world might be falling apart for you in two years. Uh, Jim, it's a 2.8% um, total budget increase. Yes. Was that the number that you said initially, or did you come to it? You know, we, uh, we, a few years ago, stopped setting a, a, what we thought was kind of an arbitrary, you know, don't go over this percent, because we felt you're, then you're making a budget around a random number, rather than what is needed to achieve the goals of the district, which is to give our, an excellent education to our kids. So our approach has been to the administration, um, build the budget that meets the educational goals that need to be met. And we'll look at it, and if it's too high and something that you know, we can't afford, we'll figure out ways to, to phase things out, to make cuts. But let's not build a budget around a random number. You have a 2% increase in, in educational spending, which is yeah. less, and a 1.5% in per-pupil spending. Yes, those are all very responsible numbers. In terms of per-pupil spending, how do we rate against the larger districts? You, you can rate it against every district in the state, but there's so many small districts that really don't have an yeah. economy of scale. How do we rate against those districts with a thousand or more students? Are we pretty much in the middle of those? Uh, my understanding is we are pretty much in the middle of those, that, that we are very on par. Um, I know that we're very much in the middle of, of, of Washington County. Um, I haven't seen, I haven't seen the specific numbers on, on a thousand or more, but my, my belief is that we're, we're at a pretty, pretty We're not an outlier. Level. Yeah, we're not, I, I know we're not an outlier. Whether in the the you know exact middle of, of those thousand or you know a little on one side, I'm not sure, but we're definitely in in the median zone. When you made your adjustments in the budget, were there any cuts that that the board made that that were painful? Uh, you know, we really managed to avoid, I think, I think any any painful cuts. There were um, some positions that that have been phased out, but there were programmatically planned phase-outs. Um, Any new equip major equipment that was delayed because you're putting in a, a tight budget? Uh, there were some small things. There was a, um, uh, a gazebo project that Roxbury wanted that we decided not to do because it, it didn't make sense. Um, we certainly haven't done you know, all, all of, all of the, the facility investments that we've looked at um, were, are needed upgrades. Well, you've got a list like the city does in their capital yeah. budget. Yep. Every year you, you know. And you that saved costs over time. I mean, what, you know, what we had, we, a few years ago, we passed a major bond to do some, uh, you know, serious and needed upgrades on our buildings. And uh, we had a discussion about the fact that that our buildings have a lot of deferred maintenance and we haven't, we didn't have a plan in place for dealing with that deferred maintenance and as a result what, what the, what we're doing is we were allowing the buildings to fall apart and then passing bonds to, to fix expensive problems and it made a lot more sense to put in uh, a relatively modest yearly capital budget and, and keep up with our buildings so that way we, we don't acquire those more expensive costs over time. Now we've got over a thousand students in our district. We picked up 13 students this year, so it's better to pick up 13 yeah. than to pick up zero or, or to lose, yeah. but we're essentially at a stable level at this point. Um, part of your budget process, and if you, yes. um, by the way, there's a budget meeting when? Uh, a public budget meeting on this. March 1st. Uh, how can people access that meeting? 
Uh, it should be on the district's website. Um, you know, one of the one of the uh, I guess benefits of our pandemic is everything is online now, so you don't have to physically go there. It will be on Zoom. So all you have to do is click a button uh, on your laptop in, in your living room, and you can attend. And but on Orca. And on Orca, yes. Orca YouTube as well as yes. Orca. Um, on, but but on Zoom gives you. Yeah, is, is the ability to, to speak in. Yeah, you can speak in and participate. Um, ask questions. Were there more students anticipated in the? Um, do you do a multi-year projection? Yes. And you've been on the board long enough. Yeah. How long? Since 2016, so five years. So you've been five years. Yeah. You've seen the projections. Are the projections fairly close to reality? Is, is the projections are fairly close to reality. Um, you know the way that. The way that students are calculated for tax purposes uh, is, you know, my, the Vermont's tax education payment system is is very Byzantine. So uh, we don't count heads. Uh, we, we have equivalencies. We have equivalencies. You know, so for instance, um, you know, preschool students do not count as a full student. Um, students that have English as a second language count for something like 1.2 or 1.3 students. The idea is to weight those students based on resource requirements. Uh, I, I don't believe, I, I, I actually don't have to answer the, the question. The budget that will be presented, the budget presentation, which is online right now, yep. uh, for the March 1st meeting, projects the high school in about five years at about 460 students, not yes. 382. Why the jump? Uh, we've got a large bubble moving through, I and mean, we're one of the few districts that are are growing in in population. Um, so we are going to need more resources at the high school um, going forward because we're gonna, we have substantially more kids. So that will help our AP program. I think it's going to help all our programs. I think it's I think it's it's a good advanced placement. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it'll be a good good to have. Uh, you know, more kids in, in the school, but we're going to have to, you know, prepare for it. So we'll, we'll be a New England regional powerhouse in Frisbee, both Maybe. boys and yes. girls. Perhaps. Perhaps. That's a hope. That's a hope. <laughs> um, Union is going to lose students. That's, that's the projection. Right now, the, some of the early kindergarten classes, the, the projection is, is it's, it's not troubling, but it, it's a lower number of students than we've seen in the past. The, the growth at the lower grade levels um, appears to be falling off a little. If Union is losing students, what does that say about the long-term viability of Roxbury Village School with 32 students if Union is losing students? I don't know if those two issues are, um, are connected. I mean, I think we do have to, you know, if we have, as we have, you know, bubbles move through various schools, I think we have to ask questions about um, you know, where we but shift But it's different than just shuffling and, and adding a teacher to the middle school because that bubble is moving up yes. or adding to the high school. We're talking about an actual facility. Yes. Um, yeah. What was the original deal with that was struck between the two districts dealing with uh, Roxbury Village School? Well, the original deal was that Roxbury Village School would basically stay intact for four years. So four years has already happened. It's happening. We, we've got, right. I think, a year left, a year or two left. What are those discuss? Are those discussions starting? Yeah, we're starting to have those discussions. This needs to be a focus of the board for the next. I year mean, it's or not so. suddenly going it's to not, close. No, and we know, don't. We don't want to do that. We. That's for a, a few things. One. Um, you know, this district has a commitment to both our communities, to both Roxbury and Montpelier, to ensure that we give kids an excellent education. And, um, you know, Roxbury Village School is a very, has been a very important piece of educating Roxbury kids. Um, if I'm correct, Roxbury Village School is newer than Montpelier High School. Is it? A newer building? Yes. I believe it is. It's it's a very nice building, and we've got a very nice facility there. Um, so we've got a facility in Roxbury that 
that is excellent and is underutilized and frankly has some assets that we don't have in our three buildings in this school. It, it's got incredible access to the outdoors. Uh, it's got a lot of, of space. Uh, it's got you know big grounds on it. Um, there's a lot of creative things we can do with that building. And I think, I think the long-term viability of that building uh, requires uh, some creative thinking and I think some joint community problem solving about how we keep it as a place where we can educate Roxbury students and maybe create some sort of attractive education model that we can- You're talking about some. a magnet school. That, that is definitely an idea that's on the table. So this calls for yet another task force. It, it might be another task force. Um, that's, that's how we seem to do things. But uh, it, it certainly needs to be a community discussion, I think, with, with both communities about how to ensure that school is um, utilized to its fullest potential to the benefit of both communities. One of the higher profile task forces in recent years was the one that came up with the recommendation to eliminate the school resource officer. Yes. Could you explain the process, how that started, and how it ended with a recommendation to get rid of the school resource officer? Well, it started with uh, some concerned community members uh, coming to the board um, and expressing concern over having an armed police presence uh, in, in our schools, that particularly for, uh, for students of color, for students with disabilities, for LGBTQ community, um, that, that that presence was, was troubling to, to many members of those communities and, and to other members in Did term. you think to go to Brian Pete, our police chief, and say, could she leave her body armor off and her, and her weapon outside? We, we did. Um, and for reasons that I think are explainable, and, and, and you know, uh, Chief Pete, if he ever comes on, can explain this to you. Uh, you know, they were uh, <coughs> unwilling to, you know, have an unarmed police officer, okay. and, and I can see why. I mean, there are, you know, there are, you know, police officers. Uh, you know, they they put their their bodies on the line, and. Um, you know, there are situations where they're in where not having uh, a weapon uh, could be fatal for them. So, so we see the reasoning there. Um, but we were looking at it from our perspective and having that armed presence uh, was... Feel intimidating. Was intimidating and, and threatening and, and created an, an unwelcoming environment for many of our students. And that is, is not what we want. Um, what was the function that the SRO, the school resource officer, was doing? Uh, yeah, doing a variety of things. I mean, uh, yeah, they were working closely with some of our social workers and, and counselors, uh, you know, to, to help with, with some, some tricky uh, legal situations, with some liaisons, you know, for activities that had to occur offside, outside of the school grounds. Um, you know, there were kind of coordination and uh, between the district and and the uh, the police department uh, when police services were needed. Uh, Is that a euphemism for a possible school shooter? Uh, I mean, they definitely helped with with safety. Although it it was, I think most of the functions that they were they had um, were were more related to uh, offenses. Yeah, to, to offenses, and I think to, you know, also situations where, um, you know, for, you know a, a kid had to interact with, with a truancy officer, for example, they were the liaison on, on those instances. So, so where there was kind of school and, and court system or, or um, you know, judicial system interaction, uh, the SRO was, was a liaison in, in many of those instances. On the city side, that position becomes the 16th member of our police force. Yes. On your side, what are you planning to do with the funds that went to half of that position? Uh, well, we, we did cut that funding in half. Uh, most of it is to give support for those functions that, that they were doing. I mean, we, we, you know, the district still needs help. Um, 
with, with some of those instances, but we can do it in a way that doesn't have an armed police officer at school and doesn't make students feel uncomfortable. So that, that's where um, Libby Bone Steele and, and Chief Brian Feet landed. And, and they, they did a good job of, of working out an alternative way to make sure that, um, that kids were getting services they need and the district was getting the services they need uh, without having that armed presence that was... was uh, that task force is continuing yes. and ongoing. What are they doing now? What are they looking at beyond that? They're just looking at, they're looking at, at, at how we look at safety in general and um, I think focusing a lot on uh, ensuring that, we're, that the school is doing what it can to create uh, a safe environment and, and, and more, I think, broadly defined safe environment to me, not just physical safety, but uh, emotional safety, um, behavioral safety, uh, and, and thinking broadly about how the school can interact with the police department, but also use its own resources to uh, ensure that, that students feel safe on all levels. Are there any other task forces or initiatives that are moving forward, community type initiatives, or is that principally all folded into there? That's the main one right now that we have. I mean, we were looking at, uh, at the middle school and how best to use that building. It's, it's an older building. Um, with COVID, that, that work has largely been put aside, and we're gonna give thought to, you know, how or if we start up that work again. Um, is language immersion in the same boat? Uh, language immersion was looked at. The conclusion of the committee was that um, for a variety of reasons, it's, it's not, not practical. Um, uh, space being one of them, we don't, we don't have the best configuration for it. Um, so that, yeah, we, we did a, a one-time study on that, and the conclusion was, was that's not the best fit for our district at this time. Um, Low-income students. Yes. In the district, it's 18% on subsidized lunches, yep. which is kind of a surrogate measure of low income. 28% in Roxbury. I'm sorry, 25% in Roxbury. I can't imagine that COVID helped that gap between low-income students and the rest in terms of achievement? No, and we don't have numbers on that, but I, I think the, uh, at least you don't have numbers I'm aware of. Um, yeah, but I think the, you know, the anecdotal information plus the information we're getting from, you know, other districts from nationally indicates that, that a lot of the students have, uh, have suffered the most. I mean, they've, they've fallen behind um, further behind. Further behind, yes. The board was puzzled. And let me stop for a second. For all the years I've been doing this, the board has been puzzling about that achievement gap. Yes. They were puzzling about it before you were on the board. They've been puzzling about it every year. Yep. Is there a task force or anything studying new approaches that might be taken? We do not have a task force right now on that. Um, it's, it is and has been a major priority. Uh, I think, you know, we've, we've definitely increased, um, a lot of our investments prior to this budget have, have been with the achievement gap in mind. Uh, increasing support, increasing literacy support, increasing math support, um, you know, getting those students, you know, that learning support, and then plus also increasing uh, emotional and behavioral support to, to make sure that they've got, you know, if, if they're, um, yeah, if they're, if they're dealing with, with difficult emotional issues, it's, it's hard for them to focus on learning. So a lot of, a lot of investment has been made there. Um, and, and I think there's been some gains, but we have a, a long way to go. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a, a big battle. Um, we don't have a task force, but it's, it's certainly a high priority on the board and the administration. I mean, for years we've been fighting being a gated community. When we talk about housing costs and reappraisal, it's really tough to yeah. buy a house. It's really tough to rent in Montpelier. Yep. And, I mean, this plays into it. What happens to the 18% that are struggling just to stay in our town economically, I imagine? Yeah. Um, so the board has turned to Libby 
for direction. I knew they did last year before the COVID uh, pandemic. And this is a priority that next year's board will, will address? It, yeah, it's, it's absolutely a priority. I mean, this is, this is a problem that um, we are always going to have to work on. It, we are always going to have to try to figure out how we can do better uh, to support, support our students. And it's, I mean, it's quite frankly a, a broader societal problem. I think you know, um, a lot's asked of our school districts. And uh, you know, I think to, to truly achieve progress here, the school districts have to do all they can. But we need, we need state support. We need federal support. Um, we need we need to give a lot of these families, you know, better child care, better health care, um, better know, after school care, better after school care, et cetera, and and make that make that affordable and accessible. Um, Is that written into this budget after school care for next year? Yeah, we're going to continue with the after school pro care program that we have. What about transportation? Are we going to continue uh, taking kids to the middle school? In, along with their elementary school yep. brothers and sisters? No, absolutely. I think that was a good step. Um, and, and that's you know, another step of, of equity is, is making sure that you know, more kids, particularly younger kids, like the fifth graders, the sixth graders, have that access to, to transportation and, and, and families aren't burdened with that. Now we have the Uber-like um, shuttle buses that used yep. to be the circulator. Uh, any possibility that kids will be riding that to Montpelier High School? Ever? I certainly hope so. Um, I, uh, you know, with COVID and with other things going on, the, at least I certainly have not been able to engage in much in, as much as I'd like to in terms of, of how we can link up. But there's been a lot of talk and there's a lot of desire. So um, I, I really look forward to, you know, finding ways as, as that system gets going to um, get as much student ridership as we can. Are the avenues still open to discussion of synergies that can be gained from partnering with Washington Central vis-a-vis -vis U32 and Montpelier High School? Uh, there are not any active discussions. Um, but the door has not been closed. The, I don't think the door has ever been closed. Uh, you know, they have gone through um, are they still one? Are they one district? Yet? They are one district. I mean, they've they've gone through a tough merger. Uh, I th I think they're, um, you know, adjusting to that and and probably not in any mood to to do anything major soon. Uh, yeah, and and I think at some level the fact of the matter is we have two pretty. I mean, if you look geographically, you know, the donut hole thing kind of. Uh, you How know, so? Can you explain that? So basically, the the Washington Central Unified Union District, um, which I think is I think I got all those words right, uh, circles Montpelier completely. It's it's Middlesex, uh, Worcester, Callis, East Montpelier, and Berlin. Which, if you look on a map, creates you know a donut around Montpelier, which is the donut hole. Uh, so you look at a map and you say that that makes no sense. But the reality is you've got, for Vermont, two actually relatively larger districts um, functioning pretty well. So uh, there, are, there are some reasons to merge, but there's also some reasons to say these are, are two districts that are pretty good size and, and, and doing pretty well. Um, if you were an advocate of that, you would say that uh, you'd have one heck of a good set of sports teams with that yes. many kids. On the other side, you'd have excellent arts and performing arts programs. If you were on the outer side of that, you would say, boy, we have access to advanced placement programs that we never had before. There are yeah. complementary things that each district has that the other lacks. There are some complimentary things that East District has that the other lacks. Uh, I, I think, I, I think it's, a, it's a tougher question than, than people think. I mean, sometimes when we also, have two, we also have two districts that are producing a lot of good opportunities for kids. That is true. As and, is. Huh? As is. As is. Right. 
Uh, you know, and some of, yeah, and I think you have to have some, some questions. You know, some of those kids who are able to play sports at Montpelier High School, would they be able to play, and who are able to play sports and really grow and benefit and get a good friend group and, and have participation? There's always a you know, would they make the team? Right. On, on a thing. And, and would they then end up maybe like doing something less productive with their time? Uh, you know, would, would, they, would they be able to make the play in a bigger high school? Uh, I think these are questions, questions that we have, have to ask. Uh, and then, you know, what does it look like? I mean, right now, one of the nice things about Montpelier is, is you've got, you know, you've got a cohort that stays together. It's one of the, I think, the few in the states from, you know, elementary school to middle school to high school. Uh, you mean you go to the prom with someone you were in first or second yeah. grade with? Yeah. Yeah. What, what happens if we merge? Do we have two elementary, do we turn Main Street into a, another elementary school and have a district where it's, you know, half of Montpelier goes to one, half of the other goes to another with some kids from East Montpelier and Middlesex? And then do we end up, you know, closing Doty down because it's, it's small, uh, maybe closing Callus down? Uh, well, we I, end up with at the eight cent merger incentive again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, I can see a lot of reasons for it making sense, but um, I, I think it's I think it's a more complicated proposition than just merging, and and I think there are some downsides. Another another downside: kids in Montpelier can walk to high school. You send them out to U thirty two, and and that's not the case anymore. And, if and, kids and in Montpelier could walk to high that, school, why do they have a full parking lot every day? <laughs> <laughs> I got one more question, Jim. Yes. What's it like as a parent? going through this. Um, you went through an entire spring with your children at home, learning online. Yeah. What, what's it like for you and your wife? Uh, you know, um, I, think, I think everyone is, is struggling at some level and adjusting. I think everyone really uh, miss yeah, you know, misses getting together and, and misses having you know there's there's there haven't been any any school events that you go to all all the regular things are gone. I think I think there's a lot of grief and a lot of, of missing of that and and certainly um, both my life and my wife's life have gotten a lot busier paradoxically. Even though we're not you know I'm, I'm not you know, my my job entails traveling. I'm not doing any of that, but. It's just been very busy managing kids. Um, it's been amazing to see the community come together and, and see the, the schools come together. And I think uh, the importance of, of school has, has been illustrated. It's, it's interesting. My kids used to complain a lot about school, but going through a few months of homeschool, um, they're amazingly, those, those complaints have stopped this year. Uh, and, um, yeah, you know, the, the spring was a struggle, and and having having in person school, even though it's been in person school with, um, with the restrictions we've had, um, the the effort put in by teachers and administrators to make it happen has been astounding, and it's it certainly for me personally, um, you know, seeing my kids, my kids have had a fantastic year this year school wise, um, and I know that the the efforts to make that possible has been above and beyond uh, the fantastic efforts that usually come in. And uh, I'm just deeply appreciative. On that note, that positive note, yes. uh, thank you for watching this show. I hope that you'll watch every one of these shows because they're all good. Uh, the one with Ann Watson as mayor explaining the city was a really good show. I referenced the one with Ann and Bill. That was a good show on the city budget. All the candidates are excellent. Uh, again, they're on the cable channel. They're also on the YouTube channel. Most importantly, get out. Make sure you get out and vote. And uh, get out and vote means possibly postmarking your um, your absentee ballot and sending it that way, or actually getting out there and voting on town meeting day. But these are the days when it is important for democratic purposes to really have your voice heard. And again, civic engagement is what keeps our town a vibrant town. Uh, thank you very much for watching.